I'm going to talk today about uh, a subject that's near and dear to my heart. I learned in fellowship to do radical prostatectomies open, and uh, I still do them open. And so my question was, well, where did this uh, technique go? So I, I feel like when I'm giving a talk like this, I'm trying to convince you all that uh, we should go back from our smartphones and go back to the old landline. Um, innovation and in technology has obviously led to great things in, in communication and who could possibly exist in 2018 without a smartphone? I know I couldn't. So, um, you know, both of these are effective ways to uh, deliver voice communication, but clearly the smartphone is uh, uh, better technology and has a lot more uses. And what does this have to do uh, with the surgical technique? Well, um, if you look at radical retropubic prostatectomy, really back in the late 90s and early 2000s, it was the most prevalent surgical procedure for prostate cancer. And uh, over two decades, it's now the least performed procedure for prostate cancer. And this is due to innovative innovation in technology and surgery. So if you look at radical retropubic prostatectomy and what has happened over time, you have technology, uh, innovative technology, which has led to marketing of this innovative technology. Um, this has led to huge industry growth uh, in robotic surgery, especially, and you see big profits in this industry, and uh, we've seen a huge reduction in, in the open technique over time. So today I'm just going to talk, I'm not really going to have any earth-shattering new uh, information on technique and radical retropubic prostatectomy. I'm sure we all know how to do a radical prostatectomy. We're going to look at how innovation in met surgery historically, uh, growth of an industry over time, the profits of this industry, and finally, what, what's in store for the future. So if you look at technique, um, Pat Walsh obviously was kind of the father of the technique of radical retropubic prostatectomy. He uh, uh, innovated and uh, did anatomic studies in the 80s, which led to mastery of the technique. But now only about 20% or less of surgical uh, or prostate cancer surgery is done by this technique. So. This makes it a relative dinosaur, if you will, in terms of surgical technique for prostate cancer. And if we look at the history of prostate removal, um, it was first developed by Hugh Hampton Young in 1905, followed by uh, Terence Miller, who developed the retropubic prostatectomy in 1945. This was refined by Pat Walsh, and finally in 1992, Schussler uh, came up with the first minimally invasive uh, radical prostatectomy. And so from this, you have in the early 90s when every, all the enthusiasm was growing for minimally invasive surgery and urology, you had development of the laparoscopic radical prostatectomy. In 2000, this was refined in Paris, and then uh, they developed the robot-assisted laparoscopic prostatectomy uh, when two robot systems actually had been developed. And Manny Menon, who is self-admittedly untrainable laparoscopic, was evidently thrown in the basement in Paris and put on the robot and he developed a technique of, also refined and developed a technique of robot-assisted laparoscopic prostatectomy, which he brought back to Detroit in 2007. And if you read our textbook of urology, you know, in the uh, Campbell Walsh, as you see in the, the title, Walsh is prominent. But in chapter 102, in the author's opinion, radical retropubic prostatectomy is still the gold standard providing the best outcomes in terms of cancer control and quality of life. So if this is still the gold standard, uh, we're, we're certainly not practicing it very often. And in fact, uh, you know, you might even consider this a technique for older surgeons. So if it is, then where did it go? Why aren't we doing it? Are we training residents um, in this technique? Are they getting enough exposure? Are we clearly going more towards the minimally invasive approach? So how do we evolve from you know, this dinosaur into uh, this uh, new innovative uh, robotic technique. So in order to look into this, you have to really look at the history of robotics and surgery overall. And this is from a paper by Yates in the British Journal of Urology. And this timeline kind of shows you how uh, robotic surgery was developed over time. So we go back to the 1980s. Uh, the first uh, uh, surgical robot was the Arthrobot developed uh, for orthopedic surgery followed by um, neurosurgical robots, and then you see uh, urologic surgery robots being developed, believe it or not, for transurethral surgery or TERP, so another robot developed for prostatic disease. And as the 80s uh, segued into the 90s, you see um, in 1990, NASA and the Ames Research Laboratory got into uh, robotics, uh, or not robotic, but telesurgery, virtual medicine, 
and robotics. And then you see also digital technology uh, started uh, to really become prevalent. And so here's some examples of different types of robots in surgery. You have the Puma, which was a neurosurgical robot, Probot, which was, uh, you can't even tell what's going on there, but that was the, the first urologic robot. And finally, Arthrobot, which uh, you can see it there, uh, machining a, a femur. And as time went by, you had different companies getting involved in the technology. So Computer Motion came out with the automated endoscopic surgical system in 1993. This was a system with just a robotic arm that a surgeon could, could either use for, uh, with his foot or voice control, uh, followed by Zeus in 1998, uh, which was also a computer motion product. Um, the first true surgical robot and the first robotic surgery was done, which was a tubal uh, in 1998, and followed by intuitive surgery, and they created the Da Vinci system in 1999, and their um, first case was actually a heart bypass done in Leipzig, Germany. So. So these are some examples. There's ESOP, which is our automated uh, endoscopic surgical arm system, and RoboDoc, which was just an orthopedic surgical robot. This was Zeus, three table-mounted robotic arms, and a uh, command and control center there, pictured on the right. And so over time, we developed from you know, a pretty primitive robotic-type arm to help us control the camera, to Zeus, to finally uh, the Da Vinci system which we have today. So in order to understand how this technology then kind of became very prevalent in uh, uh, the world, in the United States, we've got to do a deep dive into the surgical robotics industry. So if you look at uh, kind of how this developed, as I stated, Zeus was a computer motion product. It came out in 1998, followed by the intuitive uh, surgical da Vinci system in 2000. But then in 2003, intuitive surgical did something really um, pretty ingenious and they bought computer motion after a fierce legal battle for 150 million dollars. And so they became the most prevalent robotic manufacturer in the world. And this is just a, an industry report. Um, so as time went by this industry grew um, and uh, more patients and, and physicians were demanding this innovative technology to treat um, uh, disease and hospitals were demanding the technology mostly to market to patients and get their market share of patients. And so an industry grew, and this is just the industry report from 2016 um, showing that this is a robust industry, and they even use radical prostatectomy as an example, um, showing that 80% of prostatectomies in the United States as of 2016 were performed using the Da Vinci uh, surgical system. Um, and if you just look at this industry at a glance, it's a $2.8 billion industry with $394 million in profits. It has 117 businesses. And I want you to keep that number in mind, 117. Revenue and employment is pretty steady in this industry, and it's going to continue to grow. If you look at products and services in the industry, it's 35% uh, is what we know now as the Da Vinci system. There's neurosurgery and orthopedics still use robotic systems in surgery. And then steerable robotic catheters. Um, are being used in vascular and neurosurgery, but this will become, I think, even more prevalent as time goes by. And I can even see steerable robotic catheters um, application in urology. So, And who buys this technology? Well, obviously, mostly hospitals. It's exported. Um, academic institutions are consumers. And so if you look at this, this is a very telling slide. So intuitive surgical, if you look at the market share of this entire industry, intuitive surgical is 56% and then the other 44% is shared by 116 other companies. So Intuitive Surgical is the major player in terms of robotics. Shown here by their uh, revenue, $1.5 billion in revenue uh, in 2016. And, and so if you look at this company, um, you know, how have they, they really become so, uh, so prominent? Well, it's not just installation of robotic systems. It's not the service contracts. The major source of revenue, $1.4 billion, is from their surgical instruments and accessories. It's, um, as we all know, these instruments and accessories only have so many uses, and then you have to purchase more, thus giving them kind of an inelastic uh, demand curve. And as this innovative technology has caught on, more and more subspecialties have demanded it. And if you look at 2016, the, there's been more robotic procedures uh, performed than any time in history. And also, if you look at uh, 
uh, systems placement. The United States um, really has the most systems placed per quarter than any other region in the world. And this just shows uh, the number of systems um, placed uh, all over the world. The U.S. has about 2,700 versus Europe, Asia, and the rest of the world. So the U.S. has more uh, robotic systems combined than, than any place in the world. So really the United States is kind of a virtual bullseye for um, intuitive surgical. They've placed 2,770 systems, $7 billion in systems, and this averages out to about 55 systems a state, which is pretty incredible. And so when I was putting together this talk, a, a research letter came out from the Journal of the American Medical Association looking at estimation of acquisition operating costs for robotic surgery. And this was just the SEC data submitted by Intuitive um, as of December 31st, 2017. But as can be seen, it continues to grow in terms of uh, number of units shipped and installed. And we in urology think we're probably the most uh, the, the specialty that uses this technology the most, but really we're the distant third you know, behind gynecology and general surgery, which I found surprising. Um, once again, revenue was robust in 2017. And these curves just shows that as more, in, more uh, systems are installed, um, you see the procedure volume continuing to uh, kind of parallel that curve. And if you look at the curves for uh, both gynecology and urology, they seem to be flattening out, but general surgery continues to be uh, growing pretty, pretty robustly. And this is just their 10K report to the SEC, just showing the net income of $660 million. So as this technology was catching on, if you go back to 2005 when it was really catching on, um, uh, if you were a Medicare beneficiary greater than the age of 65, you were about 14% more likely to undergo surgery by 2007 than if uh, your counterpart, if your prostate cancer was diagnosed three years earlier. So it just shows the enthusiasm for this technology as it caught on. And then I wanted to look at, you know, costs of technology. Um, and really there's not a lot of great data in terms of if you just break down the cost to hospitals, payers, and society. But this is a paper that uh, did a, it was a meta-analysis from European urology that looked at costs of new technologies. Um, including robot-assisted laparoscopic prostatectomy, IMRT, and, and proton beam therapy. And if you just look at hospital costs, or 17 out of 18 papers showed that you probably increase cost uh, using robotic uh, technology from anywhere from $195 to $6,000 per case. But the cumulative evidence supports the fact that it is costlier for hospitals, but the exact difference is hard to tell, and you can decrease these costs or even make it cost equivalent increasing hospital volume if, as long as it decreases length of stay and operating time. And going back to that other paper on the history of robotics in urology, they estimated it's about 10 procedures a week or 250 cases a year to achieve equivalence. Um, what about the payer's perspective? There are about 16 papers that looked at this, uh, but basically the consensus was the potential to save costs um, uh, basically depended on uh, optimal cancer and quality of life outcomes uh, for payers. And finally, to society, there are only four papers, two from the United States, one from Australia, one from Denmark. Very biased papers, including one that actually was funded by Intuitive Surgical. But the overall um, bottom line of these papers was that if patients could return to work sooner uh, using a minimally invasive technique, then perhaps uh, this would save cost. Um, so the kind of conclusion of the authors was the overall quality of the evidence was low, indicating that the true cost difference between robot-assisted prostatectomy and radical prostatectomy may, may be sub substantially different from that reported in studies. And going back to that paper, or that research paper from the New England Journal of Medicine, they looked at costs um, and just looked at all of the procedures done in 2017 divided by the total costs, and they did account for the cost of the system, uh, service contract, and instruments. And they estimated that it was about $3,568 per case um, versus if you're doing an open procedure, it's a few hundred bucks for reusable instruments and disposables, maybe drive the cost up some more. So, so what about outcomes? Obviously, you got to pay for the technology, and you want to <clears throat> know that the outcomes are um, hopefully beneficial and uh, cost effective. So this is one of the few papers that has been published. Uh, it's actually a prospective randomized trial on 
comparing the two technologies, and this is out of Lancet Oncology in 2018. And what these authors did is they, uh, they uh, randomly assigned patients either to a robot-assisted technique or an open technique. Um, this was computer-generated. Uh, the pathologists and study investigators were blinded as to the technique, and it was uh, 323 men, 162 in each group. And it was powered to look at uh, urinary se and sexual domains of function as well as uh, oncologic outcomes. And what they found is that six months, really there was no difference in urinary or sexual domain. Twelve months where you'd think the curves would start to split because we're all taught this is where continence and erectile function uh, and it really is going to kind of be as good as it's going to get. Um, once again, they were the same. And at 24 months, uh, they were equivalent. Um, and this just shows pad usage as well as uh, erectile function at all of those time periods, which basically shows their equivalent. What about uh, oncologic outcomes? Well, this was surprising. So in the robot-assisted group, there was a statistically significant difference uh, in PSA recurrent disease um, favoring the robot-assisted group. So, um, but... Uh, the one confounding factor is the two surgeons had different uh, methods in terms of uh, treating patients uh, with PSA recurrent disease, and the robotic surgeon tended to send the patients a little earlier than uh, point, you know, the PSA cutoff as a point two. So this may have influenced uh, biochemical recurrence outcomes, but as the authors state, further this requires further investigation. So, so their uh, conclusion is that. The robot assisted, or if you compare the two techniques, um, uh, basically the functional domains are the same. So both techniques in terms of side of se urinary and sexual side effects are about the same. And oncologic differences requires further follow-up. But both approaches are, in experience hand, are, are, are good in terms of functional and oncologic results. So if you're just, if you're an economist in the audience, basically, um, you're going to say that radical retropubic prostatectomy, the open approach, still has a comparative advantage. That is, that's the ability to produce a good at a lower opportunity cost than another producer. Um, so this really is probably the true advantage of the open technique. So where did radical retropubic prostatectomy go? Well, it's been around since the 1940s, and it's evolved over time. It's basically spawned... Uh, uh, minimally invasive surgical approaches to make the surgery hopefully better for patients. It spawned research, it spawned innovation, and it, it has helped spawn growth of an entire industry, um, which is not going anywhere. And hopefully it will continue to spawn the growth of new technologies in surgery. So in conclusion, although radical retropubic prostatectomy is still a great surgical approach, um, the desire to improve upon it has led to huge innovation over time and uh, will continue to do so. Um, Robot-assisted laparoscopic prostatectomy is obviously now the preferred surgical approach for prostate cancer. Continuing to refine this technique and technology uh, will likely bring down the cost, as well as I can see that hopefully getting competition in the industry <laughs> will help bring down the cost. And finally, technologic development in the surgical approach to prostate cancer will likely create new technology and in industry not yet imagined. And thank you very much.